a result of friendly fire. They were lined up on both sides of the ridge shooting at the soldiers and the result, Indians shot over the ridges and actually hit each other causing any casualties that they suffered. So only casualties the Native Americans suffered in the Fetterman fight was when they shot themselves across the valley floor. Now, they didn't only shoot guns. They didn't have that many guns, actually. What they used mainly in this battle? What they used for weapons? Bow and arrow. Historians estimated that probably 40,000 arrows were shot in this 45-minute battle. Now, do the math on that. How many is that per minute? 45-minute battle, 40,000 arrows. Almost how many a minute? A thousand. Not quite, because we had a 45 minute battle and 40,000 arrows. But a, almost a thousand a minute. Can you A thousand arrows shot in a minute? I think those guys lasted very long. They estimate that only 38 guns were available to the Indians in this battle. The rest was done with bow and arrow. 40,000 arrows shot in 45 minutes, and 38 guns were in possession of 2,000 Indians in this particular battle. So most of the damage was done with bow and arrow. Worst defeat in American history for the U.S. Army on the Great Plains against Native Americans at the time. What becomes the worst defeat ever? The Battle of the Little Bighorn and General Custer. But this is today ranks second worst military loss to Native Americans in the Plains Indian Wars in our country's history. Okay, let's talk about aftermath of the Fetterman fight. What, what, what kind of happened then? Because what did we say that Colonel Carrington was expecting? Kellyanna, what was he expecting after December 21st? The reason I'm asking that is because he sent a guy out with a dispatch saying they needed reinforcements. So what was he expecting? He was, well, he was expecting those, but why did he need them? They thought, yeah. So after the Fetterman fight, it was expected the Indians would attack the fort and try to run it over. That was the expectation. And they had lost 83 men, which was a significant number needed to protect the fort, because how many Indians are out there? At least 2,000, right? At least 2,000. Well, we still have women and children in the fort. And because they were anticipating an attack, the women and children were ordered to go to the powder magazine in the center of the grounds. They were ordered to go to the powder magazine in the center of the ground. So I think we've talked about this before, have we not? Pete, what's a powder magazine? That's where they store the gun part. Very good. So here's the outside the fort. Here's our flagpole, right? Got a flagpole up there. Well, in this area of the flagpole was the main powder magazine where they stored all of their gunpowder that they would use to protect the fort. And why do you think in the in the world they would send the women and children to the powder magazine. You think about that as I tell you what happened next. Well, not a, after they put the women and children in the powder magazine, then they took wagons and circled the powder magazine to make a makeshift corral around it to protect both the powder magazine, maybe, and the women and children, maybe. But that really wasn't the plan to protect the powder magazine. The idea was, if the Indians came over the walls and overwhelmed the fort, the plan was to blow up the powder magazine and kill the women and children. That was a military plan. So in the event the fort was attacked and taken over by the hostiles, the plan was to blow up the powder magazine. Why in the world would they do that and kill those women and children? Absolutely. The, 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 the thought of being captured was way worse than the thought of death. And none of those officers wanted their wives or their children to be captured by the hostile Sioux, Cheyenne, Arapaho because they knew that their life would be much more miserable than death. And so that was the plan. The plan was to get them in there. If the fort was overthrown, they were going to blow up the powder magazine and make it easier on the women and children. Well, in the end, the Indians did not attack the fort as expected. Well, do you think the Indians are going to be satisfied with one 
butt kicking of the whites at Fort Fetterman? Or I mean, uh, Fort uh, Phil Carney? No. That takes us to our next subtopic then, which is the wagon box fight. Wagon box fight. When did the Fetterman fight? November, or excuse me, December 21st of 66. In the summer of 1867, Indian warriors attempted to kind of repeat the Fetterman victory. Okay? They decided to repeat the Fetterman victory in the summer of 1867. And on August 2nd of 1867, approximately 800 Sioux warriors attacked woodcutters and soldiers that were camped at a cutting area about five miles from Fort Phil Kearney. Okay, I'll repeat that and explain it. On August 2nd of 1867, approximately 800 Sioux warriors attacked woodcutters and soldiers that were camping at a cutting area about five miles from Fort Phil Kearney. In other words, a wood cutting expedition and protection was sent about five miles from Fort Phil Kearney to cut down some needed wood that day. And as they were camped, they were attacked by 800 hostile Sioux warriors. There were 26 soldiers and six civilians in that wood cutting party. 26 soldiers, six civilians. 32 people against 800. Well, the Indians' plan is to burn the camp and kill the soldiers and civilians. What the civilians and soldiers do is they take the wagon boxes off of the wagons, because they're portable, and they took those wagon boxes and they put them in a circle to get to have kind of a stack corral to protect themselves inside. So during the initial stages of the battle, the 26 soldiers and 6 civilians took cover inside an oval of wagon boxes that they used as a stock corral. In other words, they kind of did the same thing as they were going to do in protecting the powder magazine, only it was a bigger circle. Okay? So the warriors burn up their camp, and they, they start to attack this, these civilians and military men in this makeshift corral. They start attacking. The military had breached rifles. Anybody know what a breech loading rifle is? Okay, they use it in the battle a little bigger and I have one, I'll bring it in and show it to you. Basically, you open it up and you stick a shell at one at a time, pop it down, shoot. Pop it up, shell's supposed to flip out. If they get kind of sticky, they have to take their knives at the battle a little bigger to get them out. But they're one shot at a time. So you open it, I'll bring one and show it to you tomorrow. How many are going to be here tomorrow? I'll bring you one tomorrow. You open it up, pull the shell out, put another one in. They're big 4570 shells. Not easy to hold off 800 Native Americans. These aren't Henry's repeating rifles, you know, boom, boom. You've got to put a shell in every time. I'll bring one tomorrow. Well, the soldiers are commanded by Captain James Powell. And Captain James Powell, 26, 25 soldiers and six civilians are inside that makeshift corral out of wagon boxes with only breech loading rifles and they were able to hold off all those warriors until what received what came from the fort what came from the fort relief so obviously they're here in the shooting at the fort and they're going to send a tenador tenai type person with soldiers to come and relieve the wood trick because they know they're under attack because they're hearing this repeated fire so, armed with breech-loading rifles, the soldiers and civilians who were commanded by Captain James Powell held off the masked warriors until a relief force arrived from the fort. Inside this makeshift corral and after the siege by the Native Americans, only three men were killed and two wounded. Pretty remarkable when you're taking a siege from 800 warriors and armed with just breech-loading rifles. So in the end, only three men were killed 
and two were wounded. Indian casualties were much higher. They estimated about 60 killed and around 100 wounded, somewhere in that area. 60 killed, 100 wounded. Pretty good effort, wouldn't you say, by Captain Powell and his forces at the Wagon Box fight? That could have easily been another disaster for Phil, Fort Phil Carney. Well, we'll tell you about the end of Fort Phil Carney and we'll be done here. In January of 1867, was that before or after the, the uh, Wagon Box fight? Before. Colonel Carrington had been relieved of his command and was restationed at, ironically, Fort Casper. So, in January of 1867, Colonel Carrington was relieved of his command at Fort Phil Kearney and was stationed at Fort Casper. Well, by 1868, the Union Pacific Railroad had reached a point in the West where travelers didn't have to go on the Bozeman Trail anymore. And if you don't have to go on the Bozeman Trail, there's no use for the forts, is there, that are protecting the Bozeman Trail. So by 1868, the Union Pacific Railroad had reached a point in the American West where travelers could simply bypass the Bozeman Trail and there would be no more use of these forts. And by 1868, the Bozeman Trail was closed and the forts that occupied them were abandoned. By 1868, the end of 1868, the Bozeman Trail was closed and forts that occupied or protected the Bozeman Trail were abandoned. Fort Phil Kearney was abandoned in early August of 1868. Early August of 1868, about a year after the Wagon Box fight, Fort Phil Kearney was abandoned by the United States 18th Regiment. It stood as a menacing reminder to Native Americans. They hated the existence of the fort. So what do you think the Cheyenne Indians did shortly after the 18th U.S. Army abandoned the fort in August of 1868? They burned it to the ground. Burned it to the ground. Very good, Matt. And it stood burnt to the ground, basically, until 1963, when Fort Phil Kearney was designated as a National Historic Landmark. So, when we go to Fort Phil Kearney on the 17th of May, are we going to see this humongous fort standing? No, you know what you're going to see? Nothing. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, but here's what you're going to get a chance to see. They're going to have a section, probably the width of this room, with those logs up that kind of give you an idea of what it looked like. And they have boundary this whole thing, but there's nothing there, really. There's some, I don't want to spoil it, but what do you get to use when you're there? Your imagination of what it looked like. Because I'm going to take you in, sounds kind of crazy, but I'm going to take you into the museum, and you're going to see a model of the fort and a guy's going to take you out and tell you what was here and what was there and what was here and what was there and when I first went out there and I looked and I first time I went out there I've been out there many times I looked and I said that was a fort no fort it really is pretty cool after you have the lecture on what went on and what happened here and who was there and who was there now if you go out there in my opinion don't have this information it would be to me just kind of boring and what the heck but once you get this info, and we'll review it a little bit before we go, I think you'll enjoy it very, very much. We also will drive to the site of the Wagon Box fight. We will drive to the site of the Fort Fetterman fight. And we will walk the area. You'll get to be on top of Lodge Trail Ridge and walk the area to the valley. And see the three places where these people were killed. You'll get to go to the Wagon Box fight and see where the Wagon Boxes were. It's kind of fun. So we'll do that on May 17th. Okay, let's talk about a couple of things here. Um, I sent letters to your parents yesterday. 